Good morning. Welcome to worship. Let us set our hearts and minds on our Lord Jesus, who set his face towards Jerusalem, who honored his Father, who sent the Holy Spirit to dwell with us and remain upon us. Let us worship together.
The first reading is taken from Leviticus 13. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When anyone has a swelling or a rash or a bright spot on his skin that may become an infectious skin disease, he must be brought to Aaron, the priest, or to one of his sons who is a priest. The priest is to examine the sore on his skin. And if the hair in the saw has turned white, and the saw appears to be more than skin deep, it is an infectious skin disease. When the priest examines him, he shall pronounce him ceremonially unclean. If the spot on his skin is white, but does not appear to be more than skin deep, and the hair in it has not turned white. The priest is to put the infected person in isolation for seven days. On the seventh day, the priest is to examine him. And if he sees that the sore is unchanged and has not spread in the skin, he is to keep him in isolation another seven days. On the seventh day, the priest is to examine him again. And if the sore has faded and has not spread in the skin, the priest shall pronounce him clean. It is only a rush. The man must wash his clothes and he will be clean. But if the rash, those spread in his skin after he has shown himself to the priest, to be pronounced clean, he must appear before the priest again. The priest is to examine him, and if the rash has spread in the skin, he shall pronounce him unclean. It is an infectious disease. When anyone has an infectious skin disease, he must be brought to the priest. The priest is to examine him, And if there is a white swelling in the skin that has turned the hair white, and if there is a raw flesh in the swelling, it is a chronic skin disease, and the priest shall pronounce him unclean. He is not to put him in isolation because he is already unclean. If the disease breaks out all over his skin, And so far as the priest can see, it covers all the skin of the infected person from head to foot. The priest is to examine him. And if the disease has covered his whole body, he shall pronounce that person clean. Since it has all turned white, he is clean. But whenever raw flesh appears on him, he will be unclean. When the priest sees the raw flesh, he shall pronounce him unclean. The raw flesh is unclean. He has an infectious disease. Should the raw flesh change and turn white, he must go to the priest. The priest is to examine him. And if the sores have turned white, the priest shall pronounce the infected person clean then he will be clean. The next reading is taken from Luke 17. Ten healed of leprosy. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into the village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, Jesus said, Go, show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet 
and thank him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. This is the word of the Lord. One afternoon, a shopper at a local shopping center felt the need for a coffee break. She bought herself a little bag of biscuits and put them in her bag. She then got in line for coffee, found a place to sit on one of the crowded tables, and then taking the lid off her coffee, and she took out a magazine, she began to sip her coffee and read. Across the table from her, a man sat reading a newspaper. After a minute or two, she sought out a biscuit. As she did, the man seated across the table reached out and took one too. This put her off, but she didn't say anything. A few minutes later, she took another biscuit. Once again, the man did so too. Now she was getting a little upset, but still she didn't say anything. After having a couple of sips of coffee, she once again took a biscuit, this time very deliberately, and so did the man. She was really upset about this, especially since now only one biscuit was left. Apparently the man realized that only one biscuit was left. And before she, she could say anything, he took it, he broke it in half, offered half to her, and proceeded to eat the other half himself. Then he smiled at her, putting the paper under his arm, rose and walked off. Was she steamed? Her coffee break was ruined. Already thinking of how she would tell this offence to her family, she folded her magazine, opened her shopping bag, and there discovered her own bag of unopened biscuits. I like that story. It makes me think about how well God treats us, even when we are not treating Him well, thinking at all kindly about Him. Rudyard Kipling was a great British poet, one of my grandfather's favorite poets, whose writing has been a blessing to many. Once a newspaper reporter came up to him and said, Mr. Kipling, I just read that somebody calculated that the money you made from the writings amounts to over $100 a word. The reporter reached into his pocket and pulled out a $100 bill, gave it to Kipling and said, Here's a $100 bill, Mr. Kipling. Now you give me one of your $100 words. Upon receipt of the bill, Rudyard Kipling looked at the money, put it in his pocket, put it in his pocket, and said, Thanks. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 7, we read, For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with streams and pools of water, with springs flowing in the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing, a land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase, and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud, and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He led you through the vast and dreadful desert, that thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the desert, something your fathers have never known, to humble and to test you so that in the end it might go well with you. You may say to yourself, 
My power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms His covenant, which He swore to your forefathers as it is today. Scottish minister Alexander White was known for uplifting prayers in the pulpit. They always found something for which to be grateful. One Sunday morning, the weather was so gloomy that one church member thought to himself, certainly the preacher won't think of anything which to thank the Lord, for which to thank the Lord on this wretched day like this. Much to his surprise, Alexander White began a prayer saying, we thank you, O oh God, that it is not always like this. How often do we get annoyed at ungrateful people? You bend over backwards for them and they either don't say thanks or say just plainly, oh thanks, as if they have not realized the effort that you put in. Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, traveling along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered an unnamed village, he was approached by ten lepers who cried out to him. The Bible tells us that they kept their distance, which was in accordance with Jewish law. All those who were infected by leprosy were to keep far from those who were not affected, infected with the disease. Lepers were also required by Jewish law to show themselves to the priest who would then inspect them and see whether they were capable of social interaction or not. If they were a danger to society, they were not allowed to come within touching distance of another person. I've told you this before, but the word leprosy in English is sometimes deceiving in this context. In Greek, the word can refer to any kind of skin disease, not just leprosy in the modern sense, which by the way is not an infectious disease. But many skin diseases were and are infectious, and cautious steps had to be taken to prevent infection. The lepers bear in mind when they, this in mind when they approach Jesus, and they cry out to him from a distance, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Jesus responds to the lepers by ordering them to go and show themselves to the high priest. This is an unusual request on the part of Jesus since he was always questioning and challenging the Jewish law. Now he tells lepers to do what Moses commanded them. As they go in obedience, they are all healed. Take a note of the fact that it is when they obey the word of Jesus that they are miraculously cured. When they trust in him, when they move forward in faith, when Jesus tells us to do something, do we listen or do we find any conceivable way to wiggle ourselves out of doing what God has told us to do? Are we like Jonah who was told to go and preach in Nineveh and then went in the opposite direction? Think of how difficult it was for the Samaritan leper. Samaritans were despised by the Jews who saw them as half-castes. The Samaritans claimed their lineage from the old northern kingdom of Israel. And Jewish people not only questioned this claim, but they refused to allow the Samaritans unfettered access to the temple. They were not allowed to participate either in the synagogues. So they had to create their own place of worship. The only time that a Jew and a Samaritan could mix was when they were both regarded as outcasts. When the Jews wanted to insult Jesus in John chapter 8, verse 48, they said, We say that you are a Samaritan and a demon. You see how they link the two together. Now these ten lepers had found community by virtue of their common disease. It's in the light of this background that Jesus' command to them seems even more strange, that they are to go to the high priest. Why? simply because the Samaritan is not welcome there. He was not considered a Jew. He had no obligation to go to the priest. 
for him, therefore, even more than for the others. It was remarkable that he obeyed the command of Jesus. We are told by the scripture that he returned to Jesus once he had realized that he had been healed. Now think for a moment what a powerful realization that must have been. On the way to a priest who would no doubt have sent him away, he realizes that his body is free of pain and discomfort. It suddenly dawns on him like a blinding revelation that he can walk like a young man, that his skin is no longer riddled with disease. He realizes the impossible has happened. Many Christians go through life not fully understanding and realizing what God has done for them. There is a very important thing that we need to learn through this. The other lepers had gone off healed in their bodies. This leper realizes that the transformation is deeper than that. He alone has fully appreciated what has happened to him. And his seeing, his spiritual insight, leads him to understand that not only is he healed, but that he has somehow found God's salvation. God's salvation has come to him. And his return to Jesus amounts to a conversion. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. Salvation came to John Newton before he wrote these magnificent words. He realized what God had done to him, for him, to transform him from a slave trader to someone who followed Jesus. One of the great tragedies, actually tragedies in the literal sense, Greek tragedies, was a Greek play produced um, and written by Sophocles called Oedipus Rex, from which Sigmund Freud developed his theories about the Oedipus complex, which we're not going to go into today. But in the play, the main character, Oedipus, goes through life unwittingly committing the greatest taboos of any society. As a baby, he is abandoned and he's raised by foster parents. As a man, he accidentally meets up with his real father, the king of Thebes, on a road. He, of course, doesn't know that this is his father, his real father, the king. So he gets into a fight with him and Oedipus slays the older man. He kills his own father. He then goes on to Thebes, solves the riddle of the Sphinx, and as a result marries the Queen of Thebes, his real mother. It makes for compelling reading. What makes it tragic, though, is that Oedipus does not know himself or his situation. He is in utter ignorance until the very end of the play. And when he discovers what has happened, he puts out both of his eyes with his bare hands. We all go through life not seeing things that look us square in the eye. Most times we choose not to see. When a beggar approaches us on the road, when a homeless person approaches us on the road, we look the other way. When we receive our bills by email, we stick them in our never to go to email pile. Oedipus brought on his own ruin because he could not see the obvious. He could not see what was standing in front of him. How many of us claim to see but we cannot? How many of us think we understand but do not? The leper is saved because unlike the others, he came to a point of awareness. And that ultimately is the difference between gratitude and ingratitude. Jesus commends the leper for his gratitude and he rebukes the others because of their ingratitude. People who never say thanks or people who never have a thankful heart are people who do not realize what has been done for them. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 18 says, 
Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. I read quite a humorous suggested reasons for why the nine did not return. One waited to see if the cure was real. One waited to see if it would last. One said he would see Jesus later. One decided he never had leprosy. One said he would have gotten well anyway. One gave the glory to the priests. One said, oh, well, Jesus didn't really do anything. One said, any rabbi could have done that. One said, I was already much improved. My challenge to us today, this morning, is to return to Jesus, to fall at his feet like that leper does. Now he can come to Jesus and worship him, not from afar, but at his feet. Let us move towards Jesus to honor him, to thank him for what he's done for us. Let us give thanks to God for the wonderful work that he has begun in us and is doing in us. Let us think of the amazing grace of God and let us respond to that grace appropriately. Let us pray. Gracious God, lead us to a place of thanks, a place where we can honor you, where we can see, where we can become aware of what you have done and are doing in our lives. Help us to be able to see the people that you've brought into our lives. Help us to be able to see the circumstances that you have altered and are moving us through. Help us to be able to see the path. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.
Use the power of Christ in me From life's first cry to final breath Jesus commands my destiny No power of hell, no scheme of man Can ever pluck me from his hand Till he returns or calls me home Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Jesus Christ through all generations, for ever and ever. Amen. <laughs>